Hello, this is Zara Richter and Shir Ali, and this is the Facing Autonomy podcast. Um, this is a podcast uh, created through uh, the the uh, uh, the autonomous Marxist framework, uh, merged with influences from uh, left communist frameworks and uh, anarchist thought, as well as the uh, the, the uh, Johnson Forest tendency. Um, I will just introduce myself. I am Zara Richter. I have a master's degree in communication and a master's degree in disability studies. Uh, I I I do I've done work with with uh, the IWW with anti-war struggle uh, and with some uh, identity re related uh, initiatives. Um, Shear, nice to hear from you today. Yeah. You want to uh, introduce yourself? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. I think th this is like a really important initiative. We've been talking about uh, the necess necessity to sort of uh, bring to fore new radical ideas and sort of a new direction to our movements, uh, especially in the current context. A little bit about myself. I'm, uh, I I'm a former journalist from Pakistan and uh, an organizer. I was part of of the Avami Workers Party, and then after that, uh, uh, you know, transitioned into uh, a group, uh, several different groups, and I feel that my experience on the ground organizing uh, will uh, will go a long way into sort of, you know, uh, furthering the discussion about what is to be done and uh, what type of strategies and tactics uh, uh, are necessary for this day and age. Definitely. Uh, this is an exciting conversation for sure. Um, so just to in, in, introduce the next uh, part of our conversation. So, yeah, I was thinking like uh, just starting out, uh, uh, you know, just a little, about, a little bit about our relationship, how we've sort of, you know, got to know each other over the last year or two, uh, just like sort of, discussing uh, questions we've seen on the ground uh, in terms of so-called Marxist organizations. Uh, then more recently, uh, you know, the sort of collapse of the Democratic Socialist Project under uh, Bernie Sanders and, uh, you know, just various array of uh, things that are happening, uh, you know, in the so-called realm of left politics, I guess you could say. Um, what are your influences? What would you say your influences are when you're thinking about uh, revolutionary or insurrectionary politics? Well, um, I, uh, I, I came of age as a radical during the Occupy movement. And at that time, when I was participating in Occupy, I was very much influenced by the Situationists. I was only, only a college student at that point, And I was reading uh, Society of the Spectacle. Uh, by uh, Guy Debord, um, and uh, it's a it's a, it's a really good book uh, from the 19, the movement of 19, 19, 1968 in France, yeah. Situationist International, and being reading that book and seeing Occupy, I was thinking a lot about uh, pretty much the taking back of autonomous spaces publicly, you know, and this movement toward recommoning, which which was sort of in the early two uh, thousands. Um, you could see some uh, liberal and left liberal and anarchist, and, you know, kind of chorus of support for that kind of a strategy. You even had, you know, some mainstream academics in the humanities, such as Judith Butler, writing, you know, writing manifestos for the Occupy movement about their kind of retaking of space, you know, and their interruption of capitalist kind of normativity or capitalist spectacle or capitalist, you know, uh, ideology. Um, so that was a major influence on me. What 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 was an early major influence on you, uh, Sheer? Well, uh, I I personally feel that uh, my whole trajectory I was really influenced by a couple of friends of mine in Lahore, uh, uh, Amar Ali John, who's uh, an up up and coming uh, uh, sort of new left scholar uh, from Lahore. Uh, Pakistan currently uh, working with the Hukuk e Khalq movement. He's been under a lot of pressure, uh, but it was at that time in that post 2010 period we were sort of, you know, trying to understand our own politics. While uh, you know there was a dominant traditional left 
sort of seen in Pakistan, uh, I felt like as a, you know, you know, the younger sort of generation, our goal was to sort of uh, revive the movement, as one would say. Uh, so uh, we were heavily influenced by people like Badu, um, you know, obviously uh, the classics, Marx, Lenin, all those things. Uh, but uh, for me, the real experience came actually when I engaged uh, with the organized left, uh, you know, and seeing sort of the inconsistencies and lack of vision in terms of organizing and sort of, uh, you know, it was out of that critique. I started to read, you know, the Situationists, some of the French philosophy that was coming out in the 60s, like Lefebvre, uh, Bataille, those sort of people. Uh, then the Italian autonomous tradition, starting with Tronti, um, Bordiga, uh, those people. And I think that, you know, uh, for me, uh, what was inspiring about that generation uh, was the questions they were asking. And I think, you know, uh, in the context of autonomous politics and the importance uh, to recognize the vitality of working class self-organization, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, we have to uh, recognize sort of the transformations that have taken place in terms of, uh, you know, our understanding of analytical categories like class, value, all those things, gender, you know, um, uh, you know, just sort of uh, to contextualize and, you know, uh, think about wh what is to be done. Hello? Great. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, after participating in Occupy, I went through a period of heavy involvement primarily in identity politics, activism around disability identity. Um, and I, yeah, I even did a, a, my master's degree in disability studies was focused on that. And for a while, I was really convinced that, you know, organizing around disability identity was more relevant to the average person than class, you know, uh, kind of in my early time as a grad student. And then I, I started observing within the, the within the, within the the, the 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 disability movement that I was part of that there was a lot of uh, kind of nonprofit kind of involvement that was taking away the radical roots of the work, and there was a lot of kind of uh, efforts toward kind of what what they would call social entrepreneurship in the area of disability, which was not conducive toward building a movement that was truly kind of autonomous and independent the way Occupy hoped to be. And so at that point, I kind of lost faith in the identity politics project. And at that point, I started to drift toward where I am now, which is I've been organizing with the Industrial Workers of the World, you know, an organization which is kind of, it has associations with anarchist, anarcho-syndicalist, and uh, council communist, um, just radical trade unionist politics. Um, and and, and that, that, that experience was more traditional of a leftist organization because it had all the trademarks of leftist organizations such as uh, people with sexual assault, sexually assault empowered my local organization, um, bureaucracy, uh, people, uh, power playing, sectarianism, all the, all the, all the types, of, all the traits of normal leftist organizing. Yeah, I, I, I feel like there's like a universal culture around that uh, sort of this left sectarianism, which sort of impedes actual work on the ground, I guess you could say. And the lack of accountability of those people in positions of power within these left groups, I've seen that in the case of Pakistan, the various left uh, left groups I've been associated with. Uh, and I think there's always, uh, you know, this, you know, the question of organization is still very uh, vital to uh, any future project, uh, future emancipatory project, I would say. Uh, but I don't think that we've, been able to sort of uh, address that question, you know, necessarily. And I think one of it has to do with, you know, the way we look at uh, uh, the genealogy and history of a lot of the dominant paradigms within uh, sort of Marxist thought. Oh, absolutely. You know, and uh, I, 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 since my, my initial involvement in the, IW, in the IWW, which was two years ago, um, I, I got more involved in um, something that uh, anarchists like like Murray Bookchin would call kind of lifestyle anarchism, a movement that was oriented around building queer communes, 
um, which which I don't want to name to protect the people involved with it uh, because this could be heard. But I got involved in something like that, and that showed me that you can you can have organization which is less bureaucratic, which is more kind of consent based, more not not consent based. I mean, uh, it's it's more uh, decentralized in the meeting structure than than you don't than you normally see in the bureaucratic processes of of leftist struggle. And so seeing in a commune movement those kind of traits, it gave me some some hope uh, that it, it kind of brought me, me back to a bit of a, a bit of the Occupy mindset where I've been thinking about um, ways of organizing that don't set, set about bureaucratic hierarchies and, you know, brinkmanship like is present in the IWW, but was also present in the in the, you know, in the ISO, you know, a Trotskyist organization that collapsed recently. Yeah, within the past year, due to its own problems with sexual violence cover-ups at, yeah, at in the I, higher echelons. Yeah, I think um, the, it, there's no doubt. I think uh, if you look at the history of like uh, left organizations over the last anarchist groups, uh, traditional left groups uh, such as SWP, uh, you know ISO, there 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 an array of groups, uh, uh, Commune Magazine. Right. For example, like there's just an array of cases such as these where you see uh, sexual violence or an un sort of uh, uncaring uh, a, a safe space for uh, feminists or like uh, you know people from different genders or backgrounds. Uh, you know, in that case, and especially on on the question, <laughs> you know, it's just. It's just really uh, disheartening when you think about how uh, these organizations have sort of failed on that front. <laughs> it is. And I think that leads really right into a major discussion that we want to have in this podcast, which is about a theorist that has been really inspiring me recently. Um, and a theorist whose work, I think, really also speaks to the current events that we're living through within the past week, which are... Uh, Capitalistic protests against uh, extrajudicial racist police violence, um, and and that theorist that talks about all these things is uh, a fellow named uh, C. L. R. James, yeah. um, who was a major force in the uh, Johnson Force tendency in, in Marxist humanism, and uh, also a Trotskyist at points, but also someone who kind of deviated from the, the norms of Trotskyism in many of his writings. Yeah. Um, and so a, a major text that I've been reading and that some groups I've been wor- working with have been reading has been a book by C.L. James w- in which he, he worked with uh, an anarchist named Cornelius Castellanos, and that book is called Facing Reality. And our, our podcast, which we're calling Facing Autonomy, is directly inspired by the title of that book, uh, Facing Reality, because that book is such a sweeping, beautiful uh, critique both of the bureaucracy of Marxist organization and critique of... of uh, of, of of capitalism and and, tra- and trade unionism and and, and the weekends of, and, and the weaknesses of, of those uh, um, structures and and uh, uh, devices uh, as they currently exist anyway. Um, yeah, I, I I personally feel that you know uh, when you examine C L R James, is, uh, one thing is you you notice uh, his commitment to sort of anti capitalist or uh, you know, anti-capitalist formations while also being uh, critical of the existing orders within various leftist formation. I mean, uh, to come to think about it, even within the jo- uh, Johnson Forest tendency, uh, CLR James is sort of maintaining, uh, you know, his own uh, uh, autonomy in terms of his theory and uh, what he's standing for. And I think, uh you know, especially around the question of theory of the mass worker, the social factory, uh, uh, those sort of, uh, you know, uh, when the, uh, you know, the Fordist Keynesian sort of organization of society emerged in the 1920s and 30s in the U.S., uh, uh, their work was like seen as really key and, uh, uh, you know, both in sort of, uh, uh, restructuring modes of production and reproduction. And I think that, uh, you know, the work around that is sort of really inspiring when you think about 
what their focus becomes in terms of, you know, what is to be done and how should we be organizing and how should we be recognizing or understanding uh, working class uh, self-organization as such? Definitely. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, what, what the other aspects of CLR James' work that I find to be really amazing are the way in which he he, he becomes inspired by um, by uh, decolonial movements, you know, uh, and, and becomes inspired by Trotskyism and becomes inspired by some direct democratic kind of ideas in some of his works. But he 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 doesn't he doesn't. He doesn't drop the other positions as, as he takes on these new these new influences. And, and instead, CLR James's work is such a mixture of work specifically on the the issues of colonialism, work specifically on the issues of kind of Leninist Marxism, uh, you know, during his Trotskyist days, and then work that is specifically on um, newer, more what what some folks would call Marxist deviationist paths to organizing. And so he he maintains an interest in all these type, different types of leftism. Some of which, uh, like I mentioned, are kind of more new left aspects, but but he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't have to he doesn't his work doesn't require kind of uh, fully disassociating himself from any of these str these strands of thought, even while uh, even while showing showing an interest in, in all of them. So, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, when we're talking about working class, the debate around working class autonomy and sort of. Uh, you know, the Communist Party or political party as a sort of uh, uh, counterpoint to that uh, has been around even before CLR James, right? And you're seeing that in the context of like Bordiga, you're seeing that in the context of even Rosa Luxemburg, uh, you know, this sort of, you know, recognition that social democratic politics ultimately is a reaffirmation uh, of the capitalist system. And I think, um, you know, in that context, you know, the council communists, and you see that in facing reality, right? Uh, the whole uh, sort of emphasis on the Hungarian uh, sort of uh, question, what took place in Hungary, uh, you know, uh, in that context. And you see a lot of new left, uh, new left theorists, you know, in that post early 1920s, 1918, uh, sort of period or whenever it was, uh, you know, just sort of, you know, g going back to that sort of moment where they see the console communes actually function as a potential alternative, right, uh, to purely like political parties as a strategy uh, for that, uh, for class struggle. You know, and the, and these and, the, and these and these worker councils that that, that C. L. R. James and Cornelius Castoriadis kind of advocate in this in this book, you know, they 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 definitely seem to have some influence from 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 anarchistic ideas of organization, but it doesn't. But they don't require that C. L. R. James gives up his his theory his his Marxist theory of of things like dialectics or his, his, his Marxist theory of materialism, mm -hmm. and instead it's a form of Marxism that's able to kind of confront. The failures of of the political party in Europe, which which you know, you know those those acquainted w with the struggles of 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 European leftists, w we see the the Italian PCI failing. We see the the the, the French Communist Party kind of be su succumbing to liberalism. We see a lot of like European kind of Communist Party formations essentially, uh, you know, losing their ground. You know, and 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 we definitely see that in the countries which which claim to have achieved communism. That these political party formations are not remaining organic and fluid of the people's intention, but instead they're kind of becoming worn out bureaucracies and you know kind of you know stagnating in the mid 20th century. When when CLR James' work really starts to appear, he's he's watching these political parties kind of unravel uh, around the uh, around Europe, you know, and he's seeing these these attempts at party organizing just fail repeatedly, and he's also witnessing the kind of waning of American 19, 1920s radical unionism. He's seeing the waning of IWW politics. They're not able to speak to the civil rights struggle, for instance. And so That's he's really seeing the waning of all of these old old left formations, which which were so important and powerful during the early 20th century, but by the mid 20th century are stagnant. You know, almost forces that that limit possible change instead of keeping change alive, keeping you know keeping antagonism against the, the capitalism alive.
Yeah, and, and just to reiterate uh, some of his points on the worker councils in Hungary, right? The secret of the workers' councils uh, was that the shop floor organizations of the workers demonstrated such a conscious mastery of the needs, processes, and interrelations of production that they did not have to exercise any domination over people. Worker management of production, government from below, and government by consent have thus been shown to be one of the same thing. And, you know, uh, uh, and he, he was our, uh, and he said, that the councils uh, ultimately were calling for, you know, uh, the the expansion of the councils was to go to every branch of national activity, right? And, uh, you know, whether it was white collar government employees and so on. So, uh, and they saw, uh, and, and he sees the councils as sort of overriding these sort of sectarian divisions or technical divisions, uh, you know, within capitalism in that sense, I think. And what else is important about the councils, uh, you know, which, 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 uh, which, which, which was kind of, uh, which, which gets at a theme that you do see in European communism, but a theme which is never really excised or expressed well enough, which is, you know, you, you hear of this concept of like Maoist spontex or like spontaneous Maoism you know, and, and, and that was really big among some French communist theorists who had gotten little pieces of Maoism without getting the whole thing really at that at that early mid twenty mid twentieth century time, right? Yeah. And so they, they were they were interested in, in spontaneity, but but because they were still so trapped in the in the in this in this kind of uh, syllogistic debate between anarchists and Marxists that they couldn't really imagine an organization that would express um, spot, spontaneity or allow its expression in either anarchist or, or, or Marxist sectarian context. And, you know, instead, in 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 the, in the worker council, you see something that is much more directly democratic. You know, and and uh, so, so, uh, some some of the of the people I'm organizing with, we we've read a, uh, an essay by C.L.R. James called uh, called uh, "Every Cook Can Govern," and, and and you know, and 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 that essay is is it, it comes from a time during C.L.R. James kind of uh, in, in struggle within the Trotskyist party. You know, and and he he comes to this conclusion that that. Uh, Athenian democracy worked so well because it had rotating leadership, because it had an organically, you know, open model of democracy before it kind of got uh, uh, taken over by by Athenian merchants. Um, so he 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 ha- he had this recognition that there are these forms of d- direct dem- dem- democracy which could actually achieve this goal of spontaneity, which some some French Marxists who are a little bit influenced by Maoism kind of wanted. You know, French Marxists like like, like Althusser were. Were, were really influenced by Maoism and were also influenced by anarchism, and so they were they were known to be interested in this kind of Maoist spontex, mm-hmm. spontaneous Mao, Maoist fusion. But they only had an interest in that without knowing how to implement it. And uh, Cecilia James, you know, and 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 Cornelius Castoriadis, and uh, they, they were starting to really master a way of expressing the spontaneous order or the spontaneous organization of, of right. the working people kind of develop on their own. They don't need a party. To organize themselves, and that's especially what we've seen in the past week, as we've seen. Um, yeah, I was just I was just going to mention a little bit about like uh, Althusser and some of the uh, you know the communist scene in in Europe at that time. Like the Communist Party was in power uh, for for much of those periods. You see the Italian Communist Party; it's a really huge organization. Similarly. Uh, you know, the French Communist Party is a really huge organization. It had, And Althusser had control of the universities from where the situationists were sort of, uh, you know, beginning to uh, critique the sort of, uh, you know, the, the education model at, at that time uh, to make it more inclusive and m- more representative of, you know, working class power. And, it, you know, Althusser... Uh, during that that sixties period, it's sort of defending that you know, uh, defending that sort of notion of education on the basis of you know like you know professors have a technical role, and in within C L R James you see that uh, throughout uh, his piece his critique on uh, uh, intellectuals you know and their relationship with the working class movement right. Totally, totally. 
and and you know that intellectual model was was just it it was a it was a remnant from kind of Leninist ideology, uh, um, you know, which, which emphasized the role of of a, of a vanguard of a of a of a of a, of a, of a, of a sense of vanguardist revolutionaries, um, and and that that Leninist model uh, ironically went in direct opposition to this interest that that some French some French uh, communists had in this kind of Maoist Spontex form, and also the same interest that you had in, in the American New Left in this kind of spontaneous version of 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 of, of of Maoism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's always been this like sort of, you know, the specter of, you know, worker councils. Like if you think about it, like the Soviets, right. Uh, uh, were supposed to represent that, you know, after Stalin came to power. And then uh, later on when the second revolution occurred, I forgot when, uh, but, but, there was that sort of movement within Lenin too, towards, you know, giving Soviets the power, you know, as an alternative. And then you see the German worker councils and the Hungarian worker councils. So there is that uh, sort of uh, centrality of worker councils as this alternative to the party state or worker state, which is being advocated by like people like Mendel. And even like, uh, you know, uh, I forgot, uh, in the Johnson uh, force tendency, uh, uh, you know, because CLR James also had like a division within that tendency because he, he believed, uh, you know, honestly that, you know, workers, uh, you know, for any transformative system to develop, it had to be on, on the basis of w- working class self-organization, which develops uh, through the spontane- spontaneity of class struggle, right? Totally. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and he, yeah, he was definitely, uh, more, 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 one of the, one of the more council communist members of, the, of that Johnson Forrest tendency. And you got something more like Ma- Maoism from people like Grace Lee Boggs in that tendency. And of course, you know, uh, uh you know, you got, you got, you got, you know, he, Cornelius Capasquariatus didn't even consider himself a Marxist. He considered himself more, more of an anarchist, you know, and, and so, and so CLR James was almost this, this force that was, he was neither as, neither as far anarchist as, as, as Castoriadis, nor as kind of Maoist as Grace, Grace Lee Boggs was. So he was kind of the mediating influence between these two sectarian elements. Um, yeah, and I, I think that uh, it's really important when we're looking at capitalism today, right, uh, that, we see, uh, you know, my work uh, for my master's PhD was on the Pakistan railways, which I situate as a site of new imperialisms and sort of, uh, you know, geopolitics because the centrality of logistics and infrastructure in the development of capitalism is really self-evident. But uh, the point of bringing that in is is primarily because uh, we see in that case, like, there's always, and this is how also capitalism works, which is like, who is going to control that infrastructure, right? Uh, is it going to be China? Is it going to be some multinational company from uh, Europe? Is it going to be the Pakistani state? Uh, you know, and that contestation, and, and that's why it's important that we uh, look at the importance of work, uh, worker control and worker autonomy in that sense, right? Um, and there have been examples of how effective these strategies have been in the longer uh, longer term. And just with an eye toward more recent events, um, those of us involved in, in the protests for George Floyd within the past week, you know, it was very clear that when, the, when these protests uh, started out about George Floyd, that they were not led by any kind of organization. That when, when the protests began, they were almost entirely just everyday people angry on the streets on their own about a, a black person being extrajudicially k- killed. They, you know, they weren't orchestrated. They weren't, they weren't, you know, put on. These protests happened originally on their own. And only afterward did various organizations such as the Black Lives Matter organization, you know, claim, claim, claim uh, responsibility or start to get involved or start to try and take leadership to start, start to try and limit what these protests were doing, you know? And, and so I, and, and I, I think that's been repeated throughout history in really multiple oppressed groups 
uh, even to reference my own L LGBT, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I identity, um, you know, some of the, some of the riot, some of the, the uprisings of the LGBT history, such as uh, the, the the Compton Cafeteria uprising, which is a tra trans uprising, and and uh, the, Stone the Stonewall uprising, which is much much better well known. Um, these these uprisings were not planned by organizations. These, these uprisings were spontaneous reactions to 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 the conditions of capitalism by the workers, run by the workers. And so in, in that way, they were they were some of the the most obvious, you know, direct expressions of, of, of autonomous theory and praxis, just or just organically happening in the wild without 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 any, you know, uh, preparation or, or or without being created as an experiment. You know, to to to, to, to enact this ideology. So, in, in a way, the, the the organic appearance of of these you know of these mass mass struggles kind of it, it it does it does pass another another light of questioning upon this this kind of vanguardist for, formula that you get from Leninist over and over again um, in various places. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know uh, more importantly, uh, you know, the, the whole contours of those old Leninist organizations uh, have have radically transformed whether we like it or not, right? Like uh, the question of class, you know, uh, class is not a static concept and that's pretty much accepted now, uh, you know, since the 1960s that uh, class is a relation to capital and we, uh, you know, have to have a more dynamic understanding of class. Also, the whole uh, revolutionary subject question and then you look at uh, one of the things which is kind of, you know, worrying, and I see it a lot, which is that, you know, left organizations, whether it's the ISO, DSA, or these sort of organizations, they have limited, uh, they're, they're essentially rooted in the civil society. And, uh, but they're, but they all adhere or influence on some level to some sort of entryism, you know, that dialectic between entryism and, uh entryism and sort of democratic centralism, uh, you know, from the old Soviet parties. And I think, uh, you know, that's quite worrying. And then you see within the context of South Asia or uh, the global South, the influence of Mao's sort of new democracy line, which is that, you know, you know, which is which doesn't uh, give greater vitality or united left sort of uh, prospects. And I think that one of the purposes of this uh, sort of, uh, you know, podcast is to really go back and examine sort of, you know, these divisions, because the question of fascism as in sort of an opposition to sort of communist or anarchist sort of formations has always been there, right? And we're seeing a lot of far right groups sort of uh, emerge, especially over here. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, in that context, we have to have more dynamic understandings of what is possible in terms of our politics, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, and, and this topic of entryism is really important because, you know, during the time that CLR James was organizing, you know, uh, in 1970s and, you know, 80s, we were seeing a bunch of movements emerge that, that you know, did not follow the contours of, of old left struggle, but instead these movements were oriented around identity, you know, and so all leftist movements at that time had a variety of different ways of interacting. And one of the most prominent that you saw was, the, was the, those of Trotskyists that would try and appear in protests run, run by these identity groups, whether, whether, whether they be anti-racism protests or LGBT protests or feminist protests, and they would start, start, start to affiliate with, with the, the groups running the protest, even, even though the, these groups were not necessarily entirely uh, associated with the old, with the with the old left, you know, and so and so that was that was kind of the golden age of entryism, kind of the first the first uh, twenty or thirty years uh, of after 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 the mid twentieth century, you know, and 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 C L R James was one of few theorists who was who was interested in identity and was a was a kind of Marxist or Trotskyist, but really really had a really questioned entryism, which is this practice of going into a movement and being part of it and kind of claiming, claiming, you know, injecting your, your old left politics into a movement that is not inherently old left, you know, and, and trying to influence it or trying to control it or tr trying to recruit people from it into your kind of Trotskyist group. And, you know, that kind of entryist, entryist tactics is, is a hallmark of, of, 
movement, you know, uh, of of the of the, the kind of Marxist approach to the anti-war movement of the of the 1960s and 70s, and also to the anti-war movement that I was part of as a young person in the United States. Uh, there was there was part of the the early the early earliest early 2000s anti-war movement against the Iraq War. In, in in both cases, you would see these kind of Trotskyist groups going in there. You know, one of them was like anti coalition, and yeah. you know, really just trying to use the, the moment of of unrest and 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 and, and, and you know an, and anger against the the war machine, and use that to get people on you know on you know interested in in in, in their political line. You know, and 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 I and I you know I. I don't, I don't, I don't think that this was a wasted move. I, I think the people that were practicing in this were were completely sincere. But it was ultimately, um, uh, it ultimately comes from a place of refusal to respect the independence of movements that are not directly aimed solely at class. That it, it's kind of a disrespect for the autonomy of these movements, the autonomy of workers that don't immediately organize around class and instead organize around around other things. And it's kind of disrespectful almost to to think that that. That these that these that these workers don't know what's best for them, don't know what, what the important issues are, and that we need to go in there and pull them over to our our party, you know. And 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 centralism was, was somewhat similar in in which Le, you know Lenin was trying to you know create create this 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 this, this party that could that could kind of engulf all 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 other parts of the left, so one, one single united party that would that would consolidate all 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 of the, all other issues within it and within it. Particular um, bureaucratic line. So, from the Trotskyists, we see the, this attempt to, to 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 kind of colonize other movements from the inside out, and 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 from Leninists, we 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 see it from more from the outside in. And C.L.R. James refused both both of these things, and he in, in, instead insisted much of his work on 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 something that, that uh, Shir Ali already pointed out, which was this 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 issue of. Uh, of, uh, of 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 self activity that these movements were all were doing their own thing on their own terms and and that Marxists and, and anarchists had to respect that and didn't they would, should always kind of go in there and try and control what's happening you know and 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 you should instead try and work 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 with those workers as they're in a group you know instead of trying to reinterpret what they're doing over to kind of a a, a Leninist or a Trotskyist end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think like you've sort of uh, sort of overviewed that to a larger extent, but I I also think that uh, it's also reflective in the character of the unions, right? Uh, those key junctures, like within uh, you know a plethora of union movements, I think uh, uh, you know, for example, in the UK during the Thatcher era, uh, right? Trotsky Trotsky had groups, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh were were seminal uh, you know at the forefront of many of these uh you know union movements but there was no larger direction or strategy in terms of you know uh how this you know adds to our transformative uh politics but also how to broaden it you know to include uh disparate disparate classes or you know, sort of understand, you know, the class struggle on the ground, the people who have been dispossessed, exploited, you know, in those manners, you know, and it, you know, the union movement to a larger extent, uh, you know, developed a very conservative posture, I guess you could say. Definitely, definitely. Um, yes. Uh, and, and, you know, this brings us to this concept of, you know what? What does it mean to do something different than all these different kind of forms of entryism? And I agree with you what you said about the unionism because I've noticed in you know in, in my own affiliation with the, with the IWW that IWW members have a tendency toward to encourage one another to join kind of non kind of liberal or business unions as they call them, such as the the the, the SCIU or the AFL CIO, and try to con- try to bring people over from those kind of liberal capitalist unions. To their more radical, you know, anarchist or 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 leftist union, which is the IWW. So, like you said, that there's a kind of u- u- trade unionist version of entryism also being practiced. And I I think where where CLR James even turns away from that and also turns away from both Trotskyism Trotsky, and, and, and Leninism is that he truly uh, does something which, which we're trying to name our podcast after, which is this this thing where he faces the autonomy of the working class. He recognizes the, the working class, you know. 
uh, that they they express themselves autonomously. They express themselves on their own in in self organized, uh, you know, self self manifested groups. You know, and and uh, they 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 don't need a par- uh, a party bureaucracy. They don't need a Euro- union bureaucracy. You know, and in fact, that those old old left formations do a lot to uh, to suppress the 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 free and and, and then spontaneous and, and autonomous expression of working class politics because those 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 old left formations at their best moment are still somewhat controlled by this kind of petty bourgeois kind of uh, uh, vanguardist element, which has always been key in organizing these these formations. You know, this, this kind of Absolutely. organizer class, if you will, uh, which is still you still see a bit of that in in organizations like the IWW, like the ISO, like like the PSL. And and like 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 all all manner of of currently existing old left organizations, and that division between the leadership class of the organizers and the everyday worker was part of the is part of what causes all these groups to consistently have kind of sexual assault problems. Is because people in the, in the leadership group in these kind of organizations, um, they they get they get a power trip, they get a kind of a patriarchal power trip, and that allows them to to, to get away with you know behavior that wouldn't wouldn't be acceptable. If they were an everyday worker, and and they get away with that because they are they are they are defended by other people who are part of the organizer class in in that in that in that old left formation, you know, and mm-hmm. and so uh, it, ceasing yeah, to rely yeah. on on you know, ceasing, you know face, to truly face the autonomy of of the working class, we're no longer depending depending on on a, on a, on, a, on a union vanguard or a party vanguard. We're no longer depending on on, on old left organization to completely represent. The politics of the working class, and we're we're instead we're able to recognize that all all left organizations have to work have to work with organizations which are not of the old left, which 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 come from the spontaneous expression of the working class. Um, and and my, my suggestion isn't that liberal nonprofits around identity are necessarily that either, but 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 instead that 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 sometimes you know consent based practices or practices you know or uh, organizing practices which which are not uh, oriented toward kind of the Robert rules, the Robert's rules of order, or the typical bureaucratic meeting machinations, but instead come come, come about, you know, freely. Uh, these these direct the, the democratic efforts and and and, and those the, these these ideas were practiced at Occupy Wall Street. Um, they they don't they don't create a division between the kind of organizer class and the worker class. Uh, and 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 you know maybe maybe you know sex violence can still happen in those formations, but there is no there is no kind of internal dynamic that allows those 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 the forms of violence w- w- within the within within that situation to be covered up for a number of years, as, as you see in most currently existing old old left organizations. Yeah, and I just wanted to add a little uh, a few a few things from the CLRJ uh, James reading uh, facing facing reality and the conclusion, right? And um, one thing is, is that, uh, you know, he explains that, you know, Lenin centered his struggle uh, for the Russian revolution around the press. The press was the organizer of the revolutionary people around the elite party uh, because the czarism suppressed all political life, right? It was a very, uh, very difficult place to organize and, and those sort of things. So the press became a very central thing. And his criticism on Trotsky uh, is also that, that he, the uh, one was that the weekly paper uh, uh, was way too journalist, but it was, uh, and it wasn't uh, journalistic and it wasn't a worker's paper, which is really crucial. Uh, It was, uh, and he's implying that it was basically you know, for, you know, a petty bourgeois crowd, right? And then, and then the, you know, aside from that, I think uh, the, the, the one thing which I think is really relevant to today is, you know, the question of how do we integrate uh, different uh, communities into organizations or, you know, various left formations, right? And uh, what can be done on that front? And, you uh, and I think that, you know, that's why the autonomous politics framework is is really important to understand sort of working class self-organization and and that thing, you know, especially in terms of the black community, what we're seeing today uh, occur. And 
left organizations response to that right uh you know how they've shown solidarity but uh you know their relationship with those two uh is very uh distant at times you know like you see uh, there's a whole history behind that you know when you look at the black power movement uh uh, you know, and the role of like, or, uh, you know, like the democratic socialist movement during the 70s, I think, uh, you know, is an example of that. And then maybe even in the IWW history, you know, the question of black workers and uh, that sort of thing uh, is really important. But the way he looks at the, you know, uh, black workers movement as separate to, you know, uh, I wouldn't say separate, but it's sort of uh, uh, he looks at it for what it is. Right. You know, it isn't separate, but it's certainly independent. You know, it's certainly independent of the white working class movement, you know, and 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 the, the independence of the black worker movement uh, really came to the forefront in the in the in the in the in the later latter half of the, of the 20th century. You know, and, and you know, from, from that, you know, uh, we are inspired both by CLR James and by the kind of autonomous Marxists of, of Italy who, who had the, this concept of uh, of kind of self-valorization. You know that that workers workers you know have have this organizing tactic of of valorizing their own kind of labor as an organizing strategy and and, and I think certainly uh, if you consider you know you know some 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 of the black nationalist uh, movements un, under that framework their 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 slogans like like black power and the more recent slogan that you hear from a range of uh, from Organizations, some of them which are liberal, such as like Black Lives Matter, that 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 phrase is about you know affirming the independence and value of of the black worker and the, the non disposability of these workers, you know, in, instead of instead of seeing them as you know reducible to the, the the totality of the working class, they have specific mistreatment, specific devaluations, specific levels of, of, of disposability, which uh which 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 make their work specifically uh, uh, repeatedly uh, located and, and, and placed within uh, uh, a, a, a lumpen proletarian strata uh, through, through racial capitalism. And, you know, and, and, you know, a recognition of that problem, uh, you know, as, as, as a, a macro, a macro global kind of issue, uh, I think it speaks very intensely against the, 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 the you know the, the the current move that you see by liberals to kind of uh, to think that representation of of, of, of the of the struggles of certain a uh, certain specific uh, uh, oppressed identity groups can be rectified by putting in uh, mem- uh, members of their group as 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 politicians you know that 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 effort to to represent these groups via via political representation is a is a is a fundamental miscalculation of the Unique class situation of 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 that group in general, and and it it shows a a a mis you know a, a non materialist understanding of of how capitalism locates people who are oppressed by by racism as well as capitalism, you know, and and, and it shows a misrecognition of the, the independence of of that group which has been specifically you know uh, singled out within capitalism along along racist lines. Yeah, I think I I think we should definitely have like a greater um i show in greater detail about this uh, but uh um wh- what are you uh, what are you seeing in terms of sort of the responses after covid uh, you know the crisis uh, covid we're seeing a lot of like uh left sort of and anarchist sort of you know youtube channels open up podcasts open up various like attempts to revitalize things and then more recently, you're seeing like democratic socialists or other organizations, um, you know, talk about the general strike after the George Floyd killing Black Lives Matter, I think, recently talked about the general strike. What is uh, the sort of vitality, how important as a tactic and sort of for working class self-organization has, uh, you know, the aspiration of general strikes become in today's uh, day and age, I guess you could say. You know, I think that where, 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 the, where the notion of general strikes got really 
caught caught some fire over over this this COVID pandemic that we've just been dealing with has been that there was a specific group of workers who were you know remaining at work even when much of the bourgeois was was kept at home during quarantine. You had this group known as essential workers that were these these almost often often the, the poorest workers, the, yeah. the 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 least well paid workers who work in grocery stores often or, you know, do delivery or, or work in these kind of terrible customer service jobs, you know, and, and these groups were still being forced to, to go to work throughout the whole of COVID, despite many of their ranks catching this terrible disease and dying of it. These groups were still forced to, 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 to be working, you know, and so uh, th- these groups were rendered autonomous by virtue of their placement within capitalism as a sacrificial lamb to keep the system going. And so you saw a call for a general strike in in I I think it was um, March or April of this past year. Uh, that 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 was you know it was a call for a general strike, but it was focused on essential workers, you know, who were still working during the the heights of the of the of the of the, of the pandemic quarantine, mm-hmm. and you know and and uh and and so it 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 wound up you know a general strike really implies not 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 the autonomy of a single uh, oppressed group. Within the classes, but it implies a total strike of, of all workers or uh, across all areas of work. And you know, you didn't. You, you instead saw that the, the, the vanguard of the general strike during this quarantine was retail workers, arguably some of the most exploited, mistreated workers in 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 the whole economy, were were really leading the push to go on strike. And 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 they did go on strike. And there was even you know a, a, a you know well documented Am- Amazon worker who tried to have a strike within. Within the, uh, the 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 Amazon warehouses, and got specifically attacked by the the owners of Amazon, and is attacked on on multiple different fronts. And so, in in this in this quarantine moment, you really saw a moment where the, the most oppressed were 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 having to to make their own class of po- class politics autonomous from from the usual liberal or leftist structures of discontent, you know, and 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 to have their general strike. In, and the reason it didn't work is because most most uh, most other workers were not able to participate because they were already not not allowed to work but 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 if it you know if these groups had all really gone on strike you know they could have collapsed the system at at, at this point because capitalism was at its weakest during the quarantine and if you had all had all, had all the grocery store workers and all the warehouse workers really going on really really going on strike on one day it really could have paralyzed the economy it really could have done some damage even more damage to to the to the system than than the damage that was already happening to the disease, so that that was an instance uh, of where where you know the capitalists had to face the autonomy that hey if these if these Amazon warehouse workers if these Target workers if these Whole Foods workers if they all really go on strike, we will not be able to carry out the essential functions to keep the everyday person alive during this this pandemic you know and so that could have been a really a really watershed moment. But what instead happened was that was that there was no preparation, there was not enough organization, and there was not enough means for all these workers to really, you know, be supported. There was no strike fund, there was no no preparation for this. So these workers could not, by and large, go on a general strike because there was no union allowing or encouraging that, and no official liberal capitalist union allowing or or or, or encouraging that. So yeah. so yeah. I, I I think you saw a flash in the pan of excitement about the general strike tactic. That that flash in the pan hasn't happened in nearly a hundred years since the, the tactic was originally theorized by these anarchist authors like Alexander Berkman and Lucy Parsons. Um, you know, there was a real excitement about it for a minute, but there just was not. There, all there was was worker effort without any kind of preparation or organization behind it. And you know, in certain ways, that that that, that really bespeaks our our point about the necessity of facing that the uh, that, that that the working class will fight its struggle alone. And that you know the, the the best duty is uh, the, the bourgeoisie is to support them. And meanwhile, as this was going on in my in my er- area, I noticed something else that was going on, which was called mutual aid mutual aid activism, which yeah. was a lot of people who were like kind of bougie nonprofit workers. And in, in, I live in Washington D.C. That's the city I live in yeah. for, for, for context, you know. And and a lot of these bougie workers were running mutual aid mutual aid organizing during the the, the pandemic, and they yeah. were they were doing kind of like charity work. For the most affected, most oppressed people, you know, but 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 that that mutual aid work was kind of apolitical. It wasn't. It, I mean, it was a, it was political to the extent that it was trying to help the most oppressed, but it wasn't it wasn't infused with, with class politics in the least bit. It was just mutual aid because 
all the other systems of, of aid were, fa- were failing. The government was not giving people the money they needed and people were hungry and they were waiting in food lines. And so it was just a, a bourgeois reaction to, to keep the system functioning without really applying that, that mutual aid framework to a revolutionary situation. So if there had been a coming together of these bourgeois elements of mutual aid with, with the strike, you might have seen the strike more successful. Yeah, but instead, I, what we saw was that the that the, the 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 bourgeois mutual aid, you know, essentially filled a nonprofit role during the during the pandemic, and the and the strike was just run by a few poor workers who were not getting support from from the usual leftist institutions in the, in the least bit, and were not really successful in having their strike, you know. But but you did see some some really inspiring moments of say garbage workers in Philadelphia going on strike independently. And you know, and the state really being frightened and not not knowing what not not, not knowing what to do with this, but but ultimately the t- tactic was not strong enough because there was just not enough preparation. And so so I I think we saw a few a few moments of what of what it might really mean for the for the organized left if the organized left had recognized that, that the workers will do this on their own, the organized left had, could have organized themselves to to support this kind of in you know autonomous organizing behavior by retail and and and, and you know uh, waste workers but but because the left cannot kind of face autonomy it cannot face that the the working class is you know is doing all of the organizing around leftism on on its own you know it it was not ready for this moment and the, the moment passed and nothing really changed yeah and uh, yeah i was just uh, was going to add uh, you know uh, you know there's been a lot of like sort of bourgeois propaganda around, you know, looting and sort of the mass mobilizations against the police and those things. Uh, where do you see that leading and what is your overall hope of this, uh, you know, sort of movement in the long term? I mean, uh, that was another situation in which the working, you know, the, the, the you know, the property destruction was not something that was coordinated by any, you know, as much as the, as much as Trump would like to say that Antifa coordinated, A, Antifa is not an organization, and B, you know, no one was coordinating the destruction of property. That was happening freely by, by individual workers, you know, and that, that was a disruption of the economy, you know, and, and you know, and, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, and, and, and that was happening independently. And, and immediately the, the reaction by the, the, the bourgeois media, which, of course, we know that CLR James loves talking about, you know, was, was to, to mourn the destruction of property almost over black life, to, and, you know, and, and to start coming up with all these conspiracy theories about outside instigators, even though that that myth of outside instigators, yeah. you know, yeah. has 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 been reused every darn every 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 rebellion since since the fifties. That that myth has come back. They started coming up with all these conspiracy theories about about why there was property d- damage, and 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 all those conspiracy theories rested on the, on the single assumption that it was impossible that the same people who are protesting racism could also be damaging the economy that those two things are contradictory in their in their basic you know in their basic function and you know and and leftists who are more connected to anarchist politics uh, who are more connected to other forms of politics uh are would not would, 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 could easily see see past that 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 kind of and 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 antinomy that that kind of dichotomy you know and and realize that the part of the protest was the destruction of property Part of the protest was that was the burning down of the police pre- precinct in, in in Minneapolis. Part of the protest was the smashing of, of of police car windows. You know, and 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 that you can't really separate that from the protest. That that's 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 always a part of the protest, challenging the economy. But but you know the 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 the, the bourgeois leaders of the of the liberal organizations and the and and you know and the left that they they they, they just couldn't face that that the working class was doing this all on its own and and that they didn't need direction. They didn't need to. To be, you know, told what to do, and that they that they knew that these things would would get people's attention. And lo and behold, after after some days of a couple places being burnt down, you know, people, a couple of fires being lit, you know, you 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 are seeing some reaction by the, the the bourgeois class to property destruction to the extent that there are attempts at liberal co-option of this demand because it's just so so far you know, outside of what's possible is that they're trying to, to co-opt this demand by defunding the police or, you know, or, or you know, and you're seeing that just, just today there was this image going around about Democrats wearing, wearing cloth from Ghana and kneeling, you know, in this effort to try and, you know, pacify this protest, which has really influenced a lot of people with these images of burning police departments with, with, with the destruction of property, which really pushed a lot of society to take them seriously because the economy is really what, what talks 
in in capitalism and by and by 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 putting the economy at risk they really made their voices heard the the the, the black workers that were the overwhelming you know people that came out during these protests they made their voices heard against the will of both the, the formal organized left and the, the organized capitalist liberal uh liberal uh, uh bureaucracies and systems i i think we'll probably do uh, future shows just sort of getting into the nitty gritty details of what's happening but uh another aspect to this is obviously the declining u.s hegemony right uh there is a viewpoint that you know american capitalism is you know in crisis and uh as a result you know you're seeing um you know uh, you know the the whole uh apparatus of the state and the ruling class and by extension the mobilization of you know sort of uh, uh hegemonic sort of uh local fascist groups uh in various cities and towns who have been organizing being funded the police unions uh so the role of violence uh becoming more and more uh overt uh to maintain sort of uh american white american hegemony on some level uh how how much uh uh do you uh, do you see th- that confluence coming together in the movement and you know instigating sort of uh the developments taking place today like whether it's covid whether it's uh right now the george floyd protests and so on i mean i i i absolutely think that you know that this 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 issue of 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 Hong Kong, you know, the 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 issue of these global powers such as Russia and China being blamed by the two political parties, they also speak to the decline of U.S. hegemony globally, you know, and and yeah. the, the, they speak to the the kind of what 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 you would get from a political science professor saying that there's kind of a legitimation crisis about U.S. state authority that almost around the globe. And almost internal to, to, to the United States, that there's a, a widespread disbelief in in what the U.S. government says is true, you know. And and this hasn't been, you know, a sudden thing. This has been a, kind of a slow progression since the days of Reagan, you know. And and it was definitely worsened by people like Clinton and George W. Bush, you know, these presidents who were kind of known for being kind of roughshod in their policy making behaviors, you know. And and also, you know, these people were not consulting stakeholders. They were they were they were you know making decisions about the globe almost very defensively you know operation desert storm they were sending in you know troops to to maintain you know us you know colonial developments in the middle east and and iraq war was also about kind of enforcing us control over middle eastern oil you know and so i i think just like you know there was an overreaction to these protests with violence and there was an overreaction to covid with 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 blaming another kind of global imperial power you know uh that the, the United States is acting has been acting very defensively in its global policy for a period of almost 30 years at this point. You know, and, and this is just the most recent example of the U.S. kind of making policy in this defensive, defensive manner of, of trying to limit kind of violent expressions, limit the resistance of, of various groups globally and not really able to do that. And, and so having to kind of Act in this over-exaggerated, uh, you know, threatening way in order to, in order to keep its power present. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and I was just going to add uh, add along those lines that uh, what's what's quite fascinating is how uh, the response of the state has been. Right, uh, one has been like a massive crackdown on an anarchist left left groups, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter groups, people on the ground, right, like. Uh, the the sort of mass inc- incarnation uh, that has been taking place, but also uh, the sort of response, right? Uh, this sort of, uh, you know, this like sort of white capitalist class openly coming out and saying, oh yeah, Black Lives Matter, but, uh, you know, we are not going to change our system. We are not going to uh, allow for... Uh, workers to have dignity or uh you know people to have dignity or anything like that right and i think that's really fascinating like you see in the nfl like these white owners they they've sort of uh you know attempted coaches right who have been sort of these emblems of racism coming out oh yeah 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 we we understand now that race is an issue or something like that right 
but yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, exactly how you're saying that, uh, you know, there's, there's a greater need to understand working class self-organization, what's taking place on, on, on the ground and sort of, uh, how, uh, various tactics have been successful or failed in certain cases. So, yeah. And, you know, and I, I think that, you know, to come back to this question of autonomy and U.S. global hegemony, that U.S. global hegemony has gotten more violent in reaction to the, the greater autonomy of the working class globally in expressing itself outside of, of typical, you know, bureaucratic means, you know, that, that the working class globally has been more unpredictable within the past, say, almost like five to 10 years, you know, including the Arab Spring, one, one could argue, then, 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 then the global working class has been, you know, since, since before the Cold War, you know, and, you know, and, and, uh, and, and so, and so there, there really is this outpouring and, you know, it, it's, it's almost, it's almost the, the goal of, you know, kind of state capitalist structures like, 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 like China or, you know, uh, you know, the, the the U.S. to kind of you know respond to these moments of of claiming you know autonomy by these these groups of workers with these you know extreme hyper exaggerated shows of aggression you know and 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 that's what we're seeing in Hong Kong too you know during these Hong Kong protests against China trying to control Hong Kong is that China you know has been really really hyper aggressive you know threatening them with tanks threatening them with military incursion if these workers don't you know don't stay quiet, you know? And so, so I, I think that you're seeing imperial powers really having to act in these ways that are just overwrought, just almost like over emotional because, because there, there's a broader sense that on, on all sides, their, their authority is waning. Their, the, 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 their authority is just, it's just not what it used to be. And there's, there's broader questions about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I think like, uh, even in that sense, uh, yeah, it, it, it's sort of a little bit worrying, you know, you see some of those like, uh, you know, like Zizek and, uh, you know, that whole nostalgia for, you know, the old communist centrally planned, you know, like strong state sort of model, right? And, um, you know, how viable is that, right? Like they're saying, oh yeah, China was able to combat COVID within a couple of weeks and that sort of thing, right? Um, but, you know, in practicality, it's, it's sort of, it, it's sort of absurd to sort of, you know, like, you know, like sort of justify that, I guess you could say, you know, that desire for that, like old center, you know, of communist politics, uh, becomes more pre- preeminent, right? Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, it, it's ultimately a nostalgia for, uh, a time when when these established structures, you know, they they had legitimacy, you know, they they, they were treated with with faith by the broader leftist movement, you know, and it, it's a, it's this hope that it's it's this kind of revisionism which suggests the loss of authority of the Chinese Communist Party is completely to blame on the imperial powers instead of also to blame on their own counter revolution, you know, uh, the counter revolution of, of 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 say Deng Xiaoping in, in China. Yeah. Or you know, if if you want to look at the people who are defending you know Stalinism, the various counter revolutions that, that that led to Stalin coming to power, you know, yeah. uh, you know, pe- people want well, people are are going back to these you know nostalgic stories about you know the Western you know imp- you know c- colonialist capitalist powers as being responsible for for loss of, of legitimacy, instead of these forms just just not not really doing the job as far as expressing working class sentiment properly. You know, there is just not a willingness to, to, to recognize kind of the, fa- the failures of the left, you know, and, 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 uh, and, and, and so that's why you have some people, especially I would say slightly younger people who are less well versed on, on the specificities of say Chinese and Russian history, who really think that, you know, China has just made the bad guy. And we, and the answer to China being the bad guy is to get, to go and support China wholeheartedly, you know, and, and that's kind of a simplistic answer to a much, much more complicated question if you really l- look at the history of these places. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, you know, also give a, give a couple of shout outs to some friends, uh, 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 friends in Pakistan who are 
doing some good work. Uh, uh, some of my comrades in Pakistan uh, st- from the student group that, uh, you know, I've been associated with uh, Progressive Student Collective. They've started the Student Herald, which I think has been doing some uh, great work. And these are like kids from working class backgrounds, uh, you know, who are writing uh, really in-depth sort of analysis and sort of reporting on sort of uh, key issues around students. And then uh, the Pakistan Left Review, which has uh, been sort of, uh, you know, launched by the Hukuk e Khalq movement. And, uh, but I actually wanted to also just give a, you know, just sort of a quick shout out uh, uh, to a couple of people who passed, like uh, for Jad Nabi, he was in Gilgit Baltistan, which is in the north. Uh, he was shot, uh, uh, shot, and I knew him. Uh, and I think that was really important to sort of uh, give a call out to him. Then there was uh, uh, a couple of other people who I wanted to uh, sort of mention as well. Uh, uh, you know, Baloch Saab uh, in Lahore, uh, he was a unionist. He led uh, a very radical uh, sort of. Uh, uh, he, he was really influential in sort of, uh, sort of challenging um, the rigidity of of, of the rail, railway workers union during during the eighties. Uh, you know, in the face of the Islamic di- dictatorship, uh, the railway workers union, just for context, was uh, one of the largest uh, sort of communist unions in Pakistan. And he was really influential. He passed away, and this peasant leader also passed away. And uh, we could probably go into uh, detail about that later. Uh, uh, so, Yusuf Baloch Saab, and uh, yeah, for job. Okay. Yep. Yep. So yeah, uh, but I'm I'm really excited about this, and I'm hoping uh, you know like. Uh, you know, this is our first show, but, you know, like as, um, you know, we get comfortable with the whole format, we'll be able to, uh, you know, you know, increase or better our discussion, I guess you could say, maybe include interviews and other speakers as well. Yes, yes. And, you know, uh, I, I hope that we know it at the beginning of this podcast that this is our first podcast in a series, you know, and, and we're connected to various uh, various uh, leftists of various kinds. Who, who have some affiliation with, with our politics and, and our interests, and we're going to have them on, on as guests. We're going to have guests guests uh, from Pakistan. We're going to have guests from the um, American um, movements of various types on here. Um, we're going to have people of, of 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 various left groups, you know, who, who have sympathies with us, you know. And as as much as we lament several different left groups, you know, we have I have contacts in the IWW, in the DSA. In the form in the in the former ISO, I have contacts in a, in a wide variety of sectors in the yeah. American left, you know. And Solo Fuel will be on here. And while 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 our point of view is of course about the autonomy of the working class, we're we're, we're willing to talk to people w- w- without that opinion. And part of our our emphasis on the autonomy of the working class is really an emphasis uh, on on how the working class the complexity of the working class it doesn't require sectarianism. You know that, that that all of you know uh, uh, working class autonomy is, is a notion that's shared by every every facet of leftism from from Leninism to the new left to anarchism. They all believe in working class autonomy to an extent. Yeah. You know, and and so they we're not really we're we don't, we're not sectarian uh, opposed to any particular strain of leftism. Though so we we are we are we have no problem critiquing the institutions which these leftists rely upon. We're, we're open to all forms of analysis. So, so we, we hope to have broader conversations with more voices and more opinions and more more different perspectives besides the ones that that, that, that we ground ourselves in. But uh, thank you so much, Shir, for this excellent conversation. Yeah. And thank you, uh, listeners who are who are hearing us. Hopefully, um, we don't know if how many of you listeners there will be, but anyone who is listening to us, thank you so much for listening. And yeah. feel free to, to 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 look up look for our Facebook page. It's called Facing Autonomy. Um, uh, on on Facebook, and we we will have some some website uh, and and other dis- distribution sources for this podcast up really shortly. Uh, if if not if not by the time that, that you that you that you hear these words, so uh, thank you so much, listeners. Thank you so much, Sheer, and uh, I look forward to further conversations with everyone. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Have a good day.
Have a good day. Uh, okay.